Hey everyone, hope you're having yourselves a good holiday this end of 2021 as I'm recording this. This is the Summons from Gallifrey podcast and I'm your host Eric Izwa and this is a podcast focused on talking about Doctor Who and in this episode we are going to be tackling Tom Baker's final story called Legopolis. So this one was a hard one to write because Tom Baker was one of the longest doctors in the show's history. He played a total of seven seasons. So it's quite a span of years to kind of summarize within a few paragraphs, but I'll give it a shot. Uh, Let's see. So Tom Baker, he was definitely loved by fans, but it was a bit of a roller coaster in terms of behind the scenes drama working on the program between various members of the cast and crew at different times during that seven years. But as with any any production involving a lot of people, uh, that tends to happen anyways. So regardless, a lot happened during these seven seasons. So just after Robot, there were a few other stories that were all loosely part of a trilogy with the Doctor, Sarah Jane Smith, and Harry Sullivan to develop the new Doctor further for the audience kind of a an introductory trilogy several producers came and went on the show leaving their own stamp philip pinchcliffe who officially took over as the producer right after robot went on to put together some incredibly memorable seasons of the fourth doctor for a time the doctor's companion was leela a female warrior of a primitive tribe who regularly used her tracking and hunting instincts to help out the doctor K-9 was then introduced as a companion. Imagine a robotic-looking dog equipped with a laser beam in its mouth that the fans really enjoyed for the most part, but the crew always had a difficult time dealing with. Hinchcliffe left the show at the end of Season 15 with Graham Williams taking over in Season 16 based on his conception of the entire season following one main story thread, which ultimately became known as the Key to Time. This storyline involved six separate fragments to a key that needed to be collected by the Doctor and his Time Lord companion, Ramana, as well as ro- the robotic dog, K-9. The storyline concluded and Romana regenerated as the actress changed. The experiment of season 16 sort of worked, but it's quite telling that the show hasn't attempted anything since. It does, however, remain mostly a popular favorite among the fans. Season 17 stumbled quite a bit, as during the production of this season, there was a technician strike at the BBC, which ended up costing the show its final story of the season called Shada, written by Douglas Adams, which has since been released with the help of animation and restored recorded footage. So maybe one day we'll tackle that one. The last story ended up being The Horns of Nyvon, which is considered a polarizing story for most viewers. You either liked it due to how campy it was, or you absolutely hated it. However, the audience figures for Nymon were ridiculous, pulling in nearly 10.4 million viewers for the final episode, which is huge. There must have been literally nothing else on TV at that time slot. With all that being said, the audience was definitely cooling to the show as a result of Nymon, more like it being the final straw for some fans. After that season, John Nathan Turner replaces Graham Williams as the producer. While rising through the production ranks to get this job, he became known as a master of maximizing the work on productions while coming under budget, aka being able to squeeze out every single dime. The effects of the disastrous season 17 weren't visible during the Horns of Nyman but they sure were during the first few stories of season 18. A lot of JNT's budgeting expertise likely saved the show from cancellation. Christopher Bidmead replaced Douglas Adams as a script editor and wanted to return the show to a more scientific focus versus some of the comedy that Adams ended up going with and what he became known for, for Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, etc. By season 18, it sounded like J&T had become a little tired of Tom Baker's performance of the role. 
He knew that Tom Baker was bringing in massive viewer numbers, but was becoming increasingly difficult to work with, and JT felt like he was losing his touch. So season 18 becomes Tom Baker's final season. JT makes sure of it with the full press announcements being done midway through the season, as opposed to some of the previous doctors, which were done very close to the end. JT pulled out all the stops due to the show losing Tom Baker after such a long time. There was genuine concern that because of Tom Baker's popularity, the show would just collapse. A lot of the fans new to Doctor Who felt that Tom Baker was the Doctor Who and had no concept of the main character being portrayed by different actors or that there were already three different actors before Tom Baker started. In this season, we see a new Doctor title sequence and music, the Starfield intro with a synth rock accompaniment. It's a really good one. The incidental music is no longer done by Dudley Simpson and instead picked up by different composers throughout the season, uh, one for every different story. For Legopolis, it was handled by Patty Kingsland. Again, j &T was a real champion of the tradition of couching the final regeneration story of one doctor and the first story of a new doctor with familiar elements for the audience to help guide the transition. One of the Doctor's oldest enemies, another renegade Time Lord known as the Master, shows up in Legopolis as well as the next story we'll cover called Castrovalva. Legopolis is the first full story of Anthony Ainley playing the Master, and JT wanted to introduce him via his own small trilogy, via the Keeper of Traken, Legopolis, and Castrovalva. One challenge of Season 18 is to ultimately remove Romana and K9 from the show. JNT seemed to feel that the combination of another ultra bright and resourceful Time Lord and Computer Dog were basically just too OP, leading to a real lack of tension in the stories. The Doctor and Romana could overpower everyone. Bidmead came up with the idea of a pocket universe called eSpace, which the Doctor, Romana, and K9 discover when they accidentally travel through a CVE, a charged vacuum embointment. Just as the Doctor figures out how to escape E-Space via another CVE, K-9 and Romana decide to stay behind to help others out. The Doctor's teenage companion, Adric, played by Matthew Waterhouse, is a bit of a genius with a mathematical badge for excellent. While the character is pitched as an artful dodger, and for those who aren't quite familiar with that context, an artful dodger is taken from Charles Dickens' novel Oliver Twist. The Dodger is a cunning and skilled pickpocket who is a leader of a gang of child criminals on the streets of pre-1900 London, England. I find it doesn't really come across that way. In his first opportunity to do any kind of thieving, for example, Adric bungles everything up. He drops a whole bunch of melons that he's carrying. JNT then comes up with two other companion concepts to help the viewer through the upcoming regeneration process, Nissa and Tegan Javanka. Nissa is introduced during the Keeper of Traken, and at the time, the character was only put together to serve a short time period. Tegan Javanka, introduced in Legopolis, was from the very beginning a fleshed out full character. Now, full character is a little bit of a misnomer here. She's an airline stewardess with a bossy personality. That's what pretty much passed at the time as a full character. But the idea is that Tegan was being committed as a full-time character, whereas Nyssa was only originally pitched for a couple of stories. It wasn't until very late in production when JNT decided to commit to Nyssa as another full-time companion. So there's a lot going on. We've got the Master, we've got Nyssa, we've got Tegan, Adric, and finally the Doctor, Tom Baker's final, ep final story. Okay, here we are, my friends. Episode 1. Cut to a real police box on the side of a highway. A patrolman is calling into the station to provide an update. As he's talking, the sound of a TARDIS materializing can be heard while the police box does a little shimmering effect. The policeman realizes his phone connection has been cut off and checks the receiver in the police box. As he does so, the door opens and the patrolman is pulled inside. 
we just hear the voiceover sound of evil laughter. That's what it says in closed captioning, evil laughter. Cut to the inside of the doctor's TARDIS. The doctor is pacing around a room called the cloister room. Picture a sort of hanging gardens room with vines and columns everywhere. But it looks a little, it looks very overgrown, like it hasn't been attended to in years or decades. Adric comes in to try and talk to the doctor, but he's distracted, trying to work out something. Finally, the doctor talks about the cloister bell, which is an emergency alarm within the TARDIS reserved for wild catastrophes. He makes a lot of references here in this scene to the concept of entropy and the second law of thermodynamics. Adric is wondering if they're still heading to Gallifrey, but the doctor wants to delay the trip as long as possible. Romana broke the very same law of Gallifrey that got the doctor exiled to Earth back at the end of the war games, and so the Time Lords won't be too pleased. They might try to pin something on the doctor. Instead, they're heading for his home away from home, Earth. Cut to Tegan trying to leave her apartment. Basically, in this opening scene, Tegan is very excited slash nervous. It's her first day on the job as an airline stewardess. She comes out and goes back into her apartment a few times as she remembers to grab something that she's forgotten. Her passport, her purse, her bag. Meanwhile, her aunt Vanessa is out front trying to start her car. Picture a really small red two-seater. She tries it several times, but the ignition just won't turn over. Finally, Tegan decides to give it a try, scooting Aunt Vanessa over. First time, and the ignition kicks over. While the engine is warming up, Tegan starts to put on her seatbelt while going through the monologue of the seatbelt procedure of an airline stewardess. Um, and then they drive off. Back to the Dr. Nadric. Adric is asking what makes Earth so special, and the doctor replies that a region on Earth is loaded with police boxes, which is what the exterior of the TARDIS is based upon. The doctor decides that they need to find a proper police box in order to measure it for block transfer computations. Adric's never heard of this, so the doctor explains that block transfer computations are done on the planet Legopolis. And just as an aside, throughout this whole scene, I've got to add that Adric is really not very relevant here. His dialogue is written really terribly. It's just repeating everything the doctor has just finished saying. It's kind of, I, if you can imagine removing Adric from this scene entirely, it would really work as a strong monologue from the doctor just talking to himself. The doctor explains that the broken chameleon circuit needs to have the original measurements of a police box in order to be repaired. Just as they're leaving the cloister room, there's a sudden loud rhythmic gong sound that echoes throughout the whole TARDIS. Adric asks what the sound is, and the doctor misses a great opportunity to quote Ernest Hemingway, and just responds with, The cloister bell. There's a bit of cutting back and forth between Tegan and Aunt Vanessa and the Doctor and Adric. So I'll try and keep the sections together. That way I'm not flipping back and forth too, too often, which is a little bit confusing. Tegan is pulling over at the side of the road and we see that it's right near that same police box that we saw earlier at the beginning. Her and Vanessa confirm that the tire is flat. Vanessa wants to call for help, but Tegan refuses, determined to fix things themselves. She opens the trunk and digs around to find a spanner for the wheel. Tegan is trying to loosen the wheel nuts on the flat tire while Vanessa is reading her steps from a manual on how to, how, on how to do the whole procedure. Meanwhile, suddenly Adric has really intelligent dialogue and figures out with the doctor's help how the exterior of the TARDIS should be functioning with the chameleon circuit. There's an outer plasma shell around the TARDIS that should be controlled to handle the proper object configuration. It's a really small short scene, but it's a really good one between the Adric and the Doctor. The Doctor laments on not getting Romana's help to properly fix it while she was around as they walk past her room. And I think this is the only time that we ever see Romana's room. Not 100% sure on that, but I'm pretty sure this is it. There's nothing really notable in the room, but it's good for them to include for some reason. They continue on towards the main control room. 
The doctor basically admits to Adric that when he stole the TARDIS, he should have waited for them to finish repairs on the chameleon circuit, but he was in a little bit of a rush. It's been stuck as a police box ever since he arrived on Earth in Totter's Lane. The doctor crawls under the console and fiddles with some wires in order to trigger a special keyboard to pop out. He explains to Adric that it's an original interface to the TARDIS which they'll need to use to fix the circuit. He punches some buttons and a large pyramid appears on the scanner. The doctor presses some more buttons and explains that they should be able to reset the TARDIS exterior to the pyramid, but whenever he presumably hits the enter key, the pyramid shape replaces itself with the police box shape. Back to Tegan and Vanessa. Tegan is still working on the wheel nuts. We see just behind Vanessa that the TARDIS has materialized right next to the real police box. The doctor looks out of the scanner and he's disappointed. They are 2.6 meters off. Adric wants to go out to start the measurements, but the doctor wants to do this without drawing attention to themselves. The TARDIS dematerializes, then rematerializes around the original police box so that the Earth police box just appears inside the main control room. The doctor pulls out a dimensional looking ruler thing and tells Adric to start writing down measurements. Meanwhile outside, while Tegan is fitting on the spare tire, the camera zooms and pans over to a fence across the other side of the highway. We see a blank, white-faced figure dressed all in white who's creeping on Tegan and Vanessa as they try and change the tire. Meanwhile, Adric is getting frustrated that the doctor wants to go through all 37 dimensions of the police box for proper measurement. It's a necessity in order for the log Logopolitans to convert into something that can be mapped back onto the TARDIS. In other words, block transfer computation. Just in case you're still confused, Adric sums it up pretty nicely in one sentence, creating solid objects through pure mathematics. Back to Tegan holding the spare tire while Vanessa is attempting to use a tire pump. Throughout most of these tire changing scenes, Vanessa is begging Tegan to call a man to help them out with Tegan absolutely refusing. Adric is now on top of the police box taking some measurements down while trying to find out why they physically need to go to Logopolis. The doctor explains that the Logopolitans take care of all the tedious computations involved in block transfer. He reveals that they don't rely on computers or machines at all, but by muttering, they use word of mouth. The doctor explains they don't speak computations, but they intone them. But he doesn't know why. He's always wanted to find out. Suddenly there's a few flashing lights on the TARDIS console. The doctor and Adric run over to check it out some kind of instrumentation failure indicating that there's a gravity bubble inside the TARDIS. He doesn't want to dematerialize until he can check it out. He opens the door to go outside. The doctor takes a look around and sees Tegan and Vanessa still working on the tire. Just as he's about to go back inside, the doctor looks over across the highway and spots the same white figure at the fence. He looks at him for a few moments and then goes back inside. In the control room, Adric is trying to pick the lock on the police box. Just as the doctor walks over to him, the door of the police box creaks open. The doctor steps in first, and they enter another TARDIS control room. However, the lighting is definitely dimmer than the first one that they just left. There's another police box sitting in this dimmer control room in the same spot. At first, the doctor wants Adric to go back, but then changes his mind. They head over to the second police box. Back outside, Tegan and Vanessa have finally pumped up the spare tire to a point where they can roll it. Tegan decides that she'll roll it to a garage they just passed, while Vanessa stays with the car. As Tegan is rolling the tire down the road, she finally notices the police box that has been behind them the whole time. She walks over to it and starts reading the public-facing instructions. As she does so, the door opens up. Real, real nitpicky nerdy here, but it's the wrong door that opens. It's the wrong side, after all these years. It's the only time in the show's history that the right-hand door actually opens. Anyways, 
Tegan wanders inside. Just before Tegan enters the doctor's control room, the police box inside that Adric and the doctor went into dematerializes, which probably means that the doctor and Adric wandered into another TARDIS inside their TARDIS. The main door closes behind Tegan on its own. She's looking a little bewildered, but really calm, considering she's wandered into what she thought was a police box, but is now a fully blown control room with a column in the middle of the room. Adric is asking if they're inside another TARDIS, but the doctor says it's too early to determine. He motions Adric to start picking the lock on the, on the next police box door that they encounter. Meanwhile, Tegan is yelling and trying to remain calm, but she's obviously not. Suddenly, the cloister bell starts ringing again. Tegan feels that it's coming from somewhere further in the TARDIS, so she leaves the control room via the inside door. Outside, Vanessa is wondering what's going on and enters the police box to investigate on her own. Meanwhile, the doctor and Adric have gone into the previous police box door and arrive inside another even dimmer TARDIS control room with another police box inside. This is getting really confusing to describe, folks. I hope I'm, I'm, I'm not losing you. As Adric starts to work on the door lock of the new TARDIS inside the TARDIS inside the TARDIS they went into, the cloister bell starts ringing again, but it's noticeably weaker one, like it's, it's struggling to ring properly. Meanwhile, back to Vanessa. She's slowly backing out of the police box door as we hear the same evil laughter from the opening few minutes. Back inside the TARDIS loop, Adric suggests that someone is trying to get in touch with them. The doctor seems to agree, saying that they can't go back. So Adric gets back to work, trying to pick the door lock of this other TARDIS. The door opens and the doctor figures that they're close to the nucleus of the gravity bubble, another TARDIS. The doctor is convinced that someone was already there around the original police box before he and Adric arrived. He tells Adric to stay put while the doctor goes inside this new police box, only to find himself actually outside outside. Yeah, it's pretty confusing. The doctor takes a few steps and then is confronted by a real police officer asking him about the sports car. Through the open door on the inside, Adric overhears everything. The officer and the doctor walk over to Aunt Vanessa's car and the inspector points to the front seat. Uh, the doctor takes a look inside and then stands back up, realizing that the master did escape from Trocken. Meanwhile, Tegan is running around the interior TARDIS hallways and corridors, finding herself completely lost. Every corridor looks the same. Back outside, the officer wants to arrest the doctor. But the doctor refuses, saying that the master is still at large. Of course, the police have no idea what he's talking about. We finally see what the doctor saw in the front seat, the shrunken bodies of the policeman and Aunt Vanessa. Cliffhanger! Episode 2 The officer and his backup start to lead the doctor into their car to take him away for questioning at the station. The doctor notices behind him that Adric has come outside as well to see what's going on, so he very loudly suggests a diversion. Adric spots a bicycle nearby. Just as the doctor and policeman get inside their car, Adric falls over under the bike and starts yelling for help. Some of the policemen get out of the car to help Adric, and the doctor takes the opportunity to run back to the TARDIS. As the policemen get closer to Adric, he gets up and pushes the bike towards them while also rushing back into the TARDIS. The cloister bell starts ringing again, but the doctor decides that the priority is to dematerialize. He tries to take off, but there's something holding them back in the gravity bubble. He jettisons Romana's room and they finally get away. Maybe that's why they showed it in episode one? I don't know. Inside, the policemen have gotten the key to the police box and open the door to reveal just an empty police box. Basically looks like a broom cupboard. The cloister bell is still ringing, so the doctor sends Adric on his own to investigate while he mans the controls. 
Adric takes about five steps outside the door when it stops ringing, so he returns to the control room. Speaking of cloister bells, Tegan now finds herself in the cloister room. She looks around for a bit and then sits down on a bench. There's the sound of another TARDIS materializing, and another police box shows up in the middle of the room in front of Tegan. Adric explains that the cloister bell is stopped, and the doctor reveals that there was a message from Trocken confirming what he feared. There's no trace of Tremus, and the master must have had a second TARDIS hidden. He kidnapped Tremus in order to use his body for renewal. So just for a little bit of background, the master could no longer regenerate. He's another Time Lord, and he can no longer regenerate, and he's now forced to steal bodies to stay alive, which is what he ended up doing in the Keeper of Trocken. The doctor theorizes that the master knew he was going to try and fix the chameleon circuit. In many ways, a Time Lord shares the same mind. The doctor doesn't want to head to Legopolis with the master still on board for fear of ruining Legopolis. So he comes up with a plan to materialize the TARDIS underwater and open the doors to flesh out the master. Meanwhile, in the cloister room, Tegan is nervously checking out the newly arrived police box in the middle of the room. As she goes around to the back of it, the door slowly creaks open. It's pretty creepy. It's, it's a definitely bone-chilling scene, as it's pretty dark in this overgrown cloister room anyways. And then you mix in a door creak or two, and bleh, it's freaky. Meanwhile, the doctor has parked the TARDIS over the Thames River. He and Adric proceed to shut down all non-essential systems. They then materialize, which creates a slight jostle to the TARDIS. Tegan nearly falls over in the cloister room. A few moments later, there's another big bump as the doctor comments that they must have touched bottom. Tegan is on the ground now and wants a word with the pilot once she finally meets him or her. As she's talking to herself, that same laughter, that same evil laughter, is coming out of the open police box door. The doctor is laughably bracing himself against the TARDIS doors in preparation of Adric opening the door to let in the water. It's kind of like when you're driving down the road and you're holding a mattress on the roof with one arm out the window. That's kind of what this looks like, trying to slowly open a door while underwater. Adric hits the door control button and then sprints over to join the doctor. They're bracing for the oncoming water pressure, which never comes. A few moments later, the doctor backs away and lets the doors open. They go outside and find themselves on the deck of a boat. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Meanwhile, Tegan is slowly backing away from the police box and we again hear the sound of evil laughter. The doctor and Adric look above them and they spot the white figure on a bridge who starts motioning for the doctor to join him. The doctor makes a comment that nothing like this has ever happened before. He tells Adric to stay put while he goes up to talk to the white figure, who is known as the Watcher, by the way. Just it'll be a lot easier to describe him in the future as the Watcher than the white figure. Meanwhile, Tegan is trying to get out of the cloister room, but every path she tries just leads her right back into the same room. As she's just about to give up in frustration, Tegan doesn't notice the police box dematerialize behind her. She resolves to give herself one more chance to find her way out of the room. After she leaves the room, a new column covered in vines materializes in the center of the room. The Doctor and Adric return to the TARDIS. The Doctor says very little to Adric other than they're going to Legopolis. Adric wants to know how he can help, but the Doctor comments that they're in some extraordinary circumstances. The TARDIS materializes just above the city on Legopolis. It's not clear, at least to me, if Legopolis is the name of the city or the planet, as the Doctor seems to use it for both. There's a giant satellite dish pointed up into space at the center of the city, and the houses are all arranged in a very specific pattern, sort of like a giant spider with each arm leading back into the dish. So all the houses are arranged in rows which look like uh, legs feeding back into a hub. The doctor tells Adric that they're going to be splitting ways. 
as it's too dangerous for him to go on. But as Adric starts to argue with the doctor, Tegan suddenly comes through the interior door into the control room. They all look at each other, then Tegan demands to know who's in charge. The doctor just looks at Adric with these big eyes. It's hilarious. It's a really good scene. Cut to the city streets of Legopolis. All the residents are leaving their huts and making their way to some clear area in the side of the city. They're all dressed the same in some kind of black and gold robes, and all of them are white-haired. The TARDIS finally materializes in front of all of them. Inside, Tegan introduces herself, but she wants some answers. Adric introduces himself and the doctor, and then the doctor pulls Adric aside, asking him what the heck she's doing there. Tegan overhears him and demands she return her to her aunt. The doctor whirls around, asking if her aunt drives a red sports car, and admits he's seen a little of her, which is a terrible pun. I mean, it's a good... It's a good line, but, I mean, bad timing once we know. He decides that Tegan needs to come with him, so the three of them leave the TARDIS. Meanwhile, in the cloister room, the large plant dematerializes and rematerializes just outside the TARDIS. It looks like a giant potted plant, but nobody notices despite there being like 30 people around it, and it sticks out even more than the Doctor's TARDIS. It's kind of silly. There's no trees, there's nothing around there. So having a plant suddenly materialize would definitely cause a lot of raised eyebrows, but nobody notices. Anyways, one man stands out in front of the crowd and welcomes the doctor. The doctor greets him and calls him the monitor. They both know each other, though it's been a while since the doctor's last visit. The Dr. Tegan and Adric are walking with the monitor through the city streets, heading towards the building with the satellite dish. Each hut they pass is just a little mud hut with a small door-like opening. In each doorway sits a Lagopolitan on a stool. If you're going to be tired of hearing Lagopolitan, I'm going to be saying it a lot. The huts don't have any furnishings or even a bed. It's just the stool that are in these huts. The doctor is asking the monitor if they can help him fix his circuit. The monitor asks him if he's brought all the measurements that they'll need. The doctor confirms that he's got them and begs the monitor that this needs to be done urgently. They all enter the central building, which is a small control room. It's called the central register. There's a couple of computers and a big old dot matrix printer right in the front, AKA an old timey printer that spools out paper, if you know. The doctor is surprised by all the equipment, but eventually hands the small notebook with the TARDIS dimensions over to the monitor. Meanwhile, the large plant outside changes its appearance to a large Greek or Roman pillar looking thing. Picture a large cylindrical column, and then dematerializes. The monitor starts to speak into a microphone which is broadcasted throughout Legopolis. He starts muttering the dimensions of the police box from the notebook. We cut to several scenes of each street with the Lagopolitans listening to the monitor's speech, then muttering their own computations on some abacus-looking devices. Basically, it's like a large network with each Lagopolitan making a calculation, then muttering it to the next dude over, until the calculations make their way back up, the, back up to the monitor in the control room. The monitor explains to everyone that the block transfer code is now being compiled by the city residents and will turn back to them shortly. He explains to Adric that the residents are part of the block transfer computation process, as the calculations are too sophisticated for any computer. We cut to one of the city streets. Behind a sitting Lagopolitan, we see the pillar materialize. There's the familiar blast of bright orange, and then we see the Lagopolitan shrunk to the same size that Aunt Vanessa and the policemen were. The monitor is listening intently as the calculations are coming back to him. Meanwhile, Tegan is begging the doctor for some kind of explanation. He defers the job to Adric, who valiantly tries to explain what's going on in the background. Can you just imagine trying to explain everything? Oh boy. The monitor finishes recording the compiled results and hands the doctor a printout. 
The doctor snaps his fingers, finally realizing where he's seen the setup of this control room before. The Pharos Project on Earth. For some extra background, I did try and find out if the Pharos Project was a legit scientific organization or effort established in Britain somewhere, but it's a purely fabricated organization just used for Legopolis. The irony here is that the project, as described by the doctor, was established to contact extraterrestrials. The doctor, Tegan, Adric, and the monitor leave the Legopolis control room and head back through the city streets towards the TARDIS. Nobody notices, but as they walk down some of the streets, there are now some empty huts. While Adric and Tegan walk ahead, the doctor quietly asks the monitor to look after them for him, as his journey must be faced alone. The doctor slips into the TARDIS and closes the door before Adric and Tegan can get inside. The doctor brings up the, the keyboard and starts punching in the computations given to him by the monitor. Outside, the monitor leads Tegan and Adric away for a tour of Legopolis. Just as they start walking down a street, Adric hears Nyssa calling him, and he runs back to see her. Adric is surprised to see her, and she says that a friend of the doctor's brought her. While Tegan, Adric, and Nyssa start talking and introducing themselves, the TARDIS has started to glow a bright blue color. The three of them run over to the monitor, who's standing near the TARDIS, to see what's going on. Behind them, we notice that the Watcher walks away. He was briefly watching them and then walks away. The TARDIS has started to shrink in size. The monitor is really confused. How could this be happening? As Adric exclaims, the doctor is in there. Cliffhanger. Episode 3. Eventually, the TARDIS stops shrinking when it's about knee level in size. The monitor doesn't understand how or where the fault in the computation is, so he orders the TARDIS to be brought to the central register. They might be able to help the doctor, but they've got to work fast. As they go through the streets, they pass the master who is sitting in plain sight on one of the stools. Nobody notices, of course, but he's right there, right there. Inside the TARDIS, the doctor is lying on the floor, struggling to get up. For these scenes, there's a, a haze filter of some kind to give you a visual cue that something is wrong and the doctor is somehow shrunken. Through the TARDIS scanner, the doctor can barely make out that they're heading towards the central register. He sees Adric trying to talk to him on the screen, but he doesn't hear anything. Nissa and Tegan also appear on the screen with worried facial expressions. The monitor needs to trace the issue in a dimensional subroutine of the calculation, so he grabs Adric and gives him a large printout from the, from the printer. They leave the register and start going through the Logopolitans as Adric starts to read off the hexadecimal code. For example, A0, B1, C9. While they're trying to trace down the problem, Adric and the monitor again talk about the lack of computers on Logopolis. The monitor explains that computers can't handle block transfer computations because the very equations can alter the machine that runs it. Back in the central register, some log logopolitans are setting up these portable screens around the TARDIS, which is setting up a temporary stasis field to try and help the doctor out. Back to the monitor and Adric. They're going through the streets when Adric discovers a wrong calculation in the printout. The monitor recognizes where the calculation is being made and takes off at a run with Adric close behind him. They reach the street and discover a whole row of huts with the shrunken Logopolitans. While Adric labels it murder, the monitor first calls it sabotage. Adric looks down the street and he spots the watcher, who then just walks away. The monitor is satisfied the error has been found and heads back to the central register with Adric. Adric points out to Tegan and Nyssa where the subroutine error is in the printout, and so they hold it up in front of the TARDIS to hopefully guide the Doctor inside. Meanwhile, inside the TARDIS, the Doctor is finally able to get up, and he's looking through the paper that the Monitor had given him, doing his own analysis. He figures there's an error with the same dimensional subroutine, but he's not sure where. 
The doctor realizes he's at a dead end on his own, and he needs help from the outside. Just as he says this, he looks up on the scanner to see the section of the printout that Tegan is showing him. He excitedly starts punching things into the TARDIS computers. Adric starts to head out of the central register, and Nyssa spots him and follows him out, leaving Tegan to hold up the printouts for the doctor. Adric tells Nyssa that he's convinced the Watcher is the master and wants to find him. Nyssa wants to join Adric as she, ha she wants some answers about her father as well. They head out and Adric shows Nyssa the side street he was on earlier with the shrunken Lugopolitans. Nyssa figures that the master added his own voice to the computation meant for the doctor. They spot the Watcher heading down a side street and go after him. Adric takes off but Nyssa hears someone calling her name. She wanders down the street and finds the master sitting in one of the huts. Just for some extra context, in the previous story before this one called The Keeper of Traken, where we first meet Nyssa, we also met the master, who was a disheveled man in rags. The master, again, is a time lord, and he's come to the end of his 12 regenerations. His ability to survive now depends on taking over bodies which is what he did to Nyssa's father, who was named Tremus, an anagram of the master. There's a bit of dialogue back and forth between the two, and it should be really painfully clear even to Nyssa that the man who looks like her father definitely doesn't act like it. But she doesn't notice. The master puts a bracelet around her arm, an ugly one, and tells her to go back to rejoin the others, but not to tell anyone that she's seen him. Back in the central register, Tegan and the monitor watch as the, as the TARDIS starts to grow back to the regular size. The doctor steps out of the TARDIS, thanking both Tegan and the monitor. The subject of the master comes up, and the monitor tells him about the murder of the, the Logopolitans, to which the doctor also states that he's killed some Earth people. Glancing at Tegan, she catches his eye and slowly realizes that the doctor is referring to her Aunt Vanessa. She breaks down, and the doctor gives her like two pats on the shoulder, there, there. He then leaves her and vows to the monitor that he'll hunt down the master if it's the last thing he does. Guess what, doctor? Out in the streets, Nyssa and Adric run into each other. Adric can't help but notice this giant ugly bracelet on Nyssa's arm, which she's struggling to take off. The doctor walks past them both, and they all start to head back to the central register. They turn a corner and the Watcher is standing right in front of them. Nyssa states that the Watcher brought her there from Traken, and Adric remembers the dude from the bridge on Earth. The Doctor tells them that he's prepared for the worst because the Watcher is there. At the central register, the Master has put on a Logopolitan disguise and shrinks down two of the Logopolitans who are wheeling out the screens being used on the TARDIS. The master takes one of the screens and points them at the row of Lugopolitans working away and then switches it on. Instantly, all the Lugopolitans halt their work. Instead of the constant muttering and clicking of their abacuses, it's quiet. He takes off the flimsy disguise and brings the last screen into the central register control room. While the monitor begs him to stop, he activates the sonic disruptor. Meanwhile, the Doctor, Nissa, and Adric are still in the streets, heading back to the central register. The Doctor is trying to figure out why the Logopolitans have built a replica of the Pharos Project. And while they're walking around through these streets, you can't help but notice that there's so many empty huts. Just about all of them are empty now. It's gotten so quiet that Nissa points out that Logopolis has stopped. The Doctor then realizes that the Master's target all along wasn't him. It was Lycopolis. In the central register, the master has moved the second sonic disruptor to the main computer terminal. The monitor keeps imploring the master to turn off his machines. Already his interference is causing the eroding of structure and generating entropy. But the master dismisses him, then demands to know the secret project that the Lycopolitans have been working on. He also wants to know why they've created a copy of the Pharos project. The monitor refuses to answer, stating that they've made a pact that, that, that they wouldn't tell anyone. Just then, the doctor, Adric, and Nyssa enter the room. 
Nyssa calls out for her father, but the doctor tells her that it's the master. He's murdered Tremus and taken over his body. Even the doctor warns the master that he's meddling in things he doesn't understand. The monitor warns the master that Legopolis is the keystone of the universe. If you unravel Legopolis, you unravel the whole causal nexus. The master still scoffs, the monitor and the doctor. Adric takes this opportunity to move away, move... Adric takes this opportunity to move the, the sonic disruptor out of the way. The master dramatically hits a button on the remote control he's carrying, and Nyssa walks over to Adric with her arm outstretched, the arm with the ugly bracelet. She grabs Adric by the throat and starts choking him. The weird part is that the master describes the device as a neuromuscular controller for that arm, but her facial expression is of real indifference while she's choking Adric. Tegan tries to run over, but the master knocks her away. He orders Tegan to replace the sonic disruptor that Adric moved. She tries to argue, but eventually moves the disruptor back into place. The master, very, again very dramatically, hits another button on his remote, and Nyssa has her arm back, and she lets go of Adric. The doctor tells the master that Legopolis is crucial to all of creation. This could mean the end of the universe. The master still chuckles at the doctor's remarks, and to demonstrate that Legopolis can be restored, the master switches off the sonic disruptors from his remote device. But there's now just silence. The monitor sadly declares that Legopolis is dead. The master starts running through the streets and finds not a single Legopolitan in any hut. And you can hear a rumble of decay as pieces of the of the city are falling apart. The master turns around and starts to blame the monitor for this. He's deliberately deprived him of his prize. He dramatically pushes another button on the remote in order for Nyssa to start choking the monitor. This time, Nyssa can suddenly try to fight her arm while also making no, no faces, which just proves that she really wanted to choke Adric earlier. I mean, I think that's all it does. But when she gets nearer to the monitor, she suddenly finds that the entropy has eaten away her bracelet. It falls apart off her arm. The monitor confirms with the doctor that their numbers were holding the universe together. Now the entropy will spread out from Legopolis until it unravels the fabric of the entire universe. Nyssa brings up a good point. In a closed system like the universe, entropy is bound to increase over time. The monitor admits that long ago the universe passed the point of total collapse, if it had remained a closed system. Their copy of the Pharos project was a way to create voids into other universes, which now fits with the charged vacuum embodiment containing eSpace, where the doctor picked up Adric, the CBE. The monitor is feeling really defeated. The voids will have closed up by now. As they're talking, bits of the street are collapsing and falling apart around them. Sections of wall, huts, etc. The whole group make their way back to the area where the TARDIS first landed. The Doctor and the Master form an alliance to try and find a way to reverse the entropy somehow before it spreads beyond anyone's control. Nyssa, Adric, and Tegan all start protesting this idea of working with the Master. The monitor takes off, heading back towards the central register. Suddenly, the TARDIS materializes right next to the group. The doctor tells them the watcher is piloting it and herds the three companions inside where they'll be safe. They still protest, but they all go in. The doctor and the master shake hands as they decide to formally work together. Cliffhanger... Episode 4, the last episode of Tom Baker. The Doctor and the Master notice the monitor is gone and decide to head towards the central register. Tegan slips back out of the TARDIS intent on sticking with the Doctor. Her reasoning is weird, but whatever. She needs to because of the story. The TARDIS then dematerializes. The Doctor and the Master make it back to the central register where the monitor is busy printing out all the research work done on creating the void junctions into the other universes. Meanwhile, Tegan is running through the streets, shouting for the doctor. She finally makes it to the central register. 
The monitor tells the doctor and the master that they must reposition the satellite dish aerial. There was a CVE close by that they still might be able to use. The master proposes they first withdraw to a place of stability, then link their two TARDISes to reconfigure them as time cone inverters. Tegan points at the monitor who is suddenly disappearing, decaying right in front of them. He kind of just dissolves. It's a pretty cool effect. The master panics and bails from the agreement, running out of the central register towards his own TARDIS to abandon the Doctor and Tegan. Tegan wants to go after him, but the Doctor stops her. He admits it's a brilliant plan. He needs her help to take the monitor's work with them. They start taking apart the monitor's main computer. The master makes it back to his TARDIS and is just about to enter it when the roof of the hut caves in, knocking the master unconscious. The doctor excitedly realizes that the monitor's equipment is using bubble memory, which means the last state of their research work is all retained in the computer memory. All they need to do is find a computer to run it on. Gee, I wonder where they'll find one. Where could they possibly need to go to find another computer just like the one they're using on Legopolis? Yes, that's right. Earth and the Pharos Project. Tegan and the Doctor run out of the central register holding the computer boards and find their way to the Master's TARDIS. They lift off the bits of rubble to free the Master and they all leave in his TARDIS together. Cut to Earth. A dude working the night shift is in the same looking computer room that we just left on Legopolis. He's wearing headphones, and he gets up and leaves the room just as the Master's TARDIS materializes in the corner. The Doctor and the Master leave and start creeping around the room. They hide when the night shift dude returns. The Doctor tries to get the dude's attention, and then notices at the last second that the Master is aiming his TCE at him. The Tissue Compression Eliminator, aka the Shrink Gun. So the Doctor pushes the dude out of the way, which saves him, but knocks him unconscious. The master is pleased as it would have been a difficult conversation. Meanwhile, back on the TARDIS, the watcher has somehow managed to remove the TARDIS from time and space. They're safe for now. Nissa and Adric are walking in the cloister room when they notice the watcher motioning to Adric that he wants to talk to him. Nissa stays behind as Adric goes over to him. Back on Earth, the doctor is busy putting the computer boards from Legopolis into the back of the same computer on Earth. The master isn't so confident that everything will work, but the doctor is hopeful that enough of the project is recoverable. Back on the TARDIS, Adric returns to Nissa's side, and he leads her back to the main control room. He hasn't said what the Watcher told him, but he knows they've got to get to the Pharos project on Earth. He and Nissa start setting the coordinates. Nissa flicks a switch, and manages to turn on the scanner, which is picking up a view of the entire universe. They both start to watch and point out a dark cloud which is slowly starting to eat away at systems, aka the entropy. Adric spots Earth and tells Nissa that they only have a few hours left. While Nissa is watching her own planet of Traken, it disappears into the black void right in front of her eyes. Adric comes over to try and help her find it, but realizes right away that it's gone. Nyssa makes a very heartful statement here about the master taking away her father, her stepmother, and now her entire homeworld, blotted out forever. Adric finishes putting in the coordinates and he hits a few switches. They leave their haven from outside time and space and return to the universe, materializing on Earth right next to the giant satellite of the Pharos Project. They leave the TARDIS and start to make their way towards the control room pointing out that it's just like the one on Legopolis. They do some dodging and hiding in the light forest, as there's some guards in the area. Great sneaky music here, by the way. It's a, a really neat guitar riff. The doctor has finished getting the computer boards and project up and running on the Pharos computer. They just need to reposition the aerial to find the nearest CVE. To get to the aerial on the dish, they'll have to leave the control room and run across the field to get to the aerial controls. As they're walking through the complex, the doctor looks out a window and spots the TARDIS along with the watcher, who's just waiting in the TARDIS doorway. 
The Doctor, Master, and Tegan are also running across some green space while trying to avoid detection from the guards. It turns out that Nissa and Adric are just behind the Doctor, the Master, and Tegan. The Master is just about to use his TCE on a group of guards when the Doctor grabs it from him and throws it away. The noise alerts the guards who start chasing them. The Doctor, Master, and Tegan try to hide behind a shed, but the guards are still coming closer. Before they can spot the Doctor, Adric and Nissa come up to the guards and distract them by explaining that they're aliens, and they've come to Earth thanks to the Pharos Project. Tegan leaves the Doctor and the Master to join Adric and Nissa in the distraction. The Doctor and the Master take the opportunity to get to the aerial. As they're running through the field, the Master spots his TCE that the Doctor had thrown away, and he picks it up. The Doctor finally gets to the stairs leading up to the aerial controls, and he starts climbing. Meanwhile, the Master has returned back to the control room. He grabs the tape recorder that the still unconscious night dude was listening to before getting knocked out. The Master then gets into his own TARDIS. The Doctor is still climbing the stairs. It's a long way to go up. He makes it into the room just in time to hear the Master's laugh. His column TARDIS is sitting in the corner. He states that from here, the near CVE is in Cassiopeia. The master punches in some coordinates and the satellite dish starts to move to reposition itself. The master has all the necessary cables hooked up from his TARDIS and he only needs to connect one more to link it up with the monitor's program running on the Pharaoh's computer. But he hands the connectors over to the doctor to grant him the honor of linking things up since it was the doctor's original plan. Because it's so suspicious, the doctor kind of hesitantly takes the cables from the master, but then he finally connects them together. As he's doing this, the master has gone outside onto a gangplank and starts recording a speech into the tape recorder. Down below, an, al an alarm is going off, which is alerting the guards that something is going on. They're all starting to run around everywhere. The Master rejoins the Doctor near the cables, and they both see that things are starting to take shape with the CVE that they've pointed the dish at. The Doctor is about to leave to try and help Tegan and Adric down below with the guards, but then realizes the Master is up to something. Before he can move, the Master holds the TCE pointed at the Doctor. He presses play on his tape recorder, and it starts to broadcast a blackmail message to the rest of the universe either subject themselves to living under the rule of the Master, or face total annihilation. The Master starts some more evil laughter, exclaiming that the CVE is all his to control. The Doctor realizes he can sever th the connection from outside, and he ducks out of the control room onto the gangplank. The Master follows him and trips on the Doctor's scarf that he tied just outside the small door. He falls on the gangplank, and the Doctor is able to kick away the TCE in his hand down to the ground below. The master then ducks back into the control room and pushes some buttons, which causes the dish to start to move again. The doctor is still out there, and he grabs hold of the walkway as the whole structure starts to rotate. Note that in this shot, for some reason, maybe they, didn't, they couldn't get Anthony Ainley that day for filming, I don't know, but they needed a shot of the master in the small doorway behind the doctor, and so they chose to use a cardboard cutout of the master. You'll notice in these few shots for a few seconds, the master's not moving at all. In some of the old VHS copies of this, you could really tell uh, the effect. On the digital format, it's quite hard to make the distinction now. The guards are making their way over to the stairs down below, but the walkway with the doctor on it is still turning. Down below, Nissa, Tegan, and Adric are just transfixed on the ground, looking up at the doctor and watching him. As if they can see him, like he's very far away. He's a speck on the aerial compared to where Nissa, Tegan, and Adric are trying to watch him from. The doctor is trying to crawl over to a large cable plugged into the dish. The master is watching as the doctor is trying to unplug the cable which would disconnect the master's control of the CVE. With the walkway nearly upside down, the doctor makes one final attempt and manages to dislocate the cable. But as he does so, he falls off. He's dangling up in the air, holding onto the cable. 
We then see a small montage of the Doctor's enemies throughout the last seven seasons, all calling his name. So you've got like Daleks, Cybermen, the Master, like the original Master who was in rags, just saying Doctor, Doctor, Doctor. The Doctor lets go of the cable to try and hang on to the metal scaffolding of the aerial, but his grip slips and he falls. Adric, Nissa, and T react instantly as the Doctor hits the ground. It's another real nitpicky thing here. Obviously, they're they're trying to act as if they're watching the Doctor fall to the ground from the high aerial, but they're the way that they they don't even track someone who might be falling from a distance that great. Their their heads just kind of go looking straight up to looking instantly down at the ground. So again, it's another nitpick. It doesn't really ruin the story. It just looks kind of weird. That's all. Anyways, the master collects his equipment from the setup and dematerializes in his TARDIS just as the guards reach the room. We now see the doctor lying on his back on the ground as Tegan, Nissa, and Adric run up to where he fell. They all kneel on the ground surrounding him, all asking him, Doctor? We then see a montage of all the companions over the past seven years. So we see Sarah Jane Smith, Harry Sullivan, the Brigadier, Leela, K-9, and the two Romanas, all saying, Doctor? 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 He realizes that Adric is calling him, and he turns his head to look at him. It's the end, says the doctor, but the moment has been prepared for. He glances at a direction over his shoulder, and they all see the Watcher. The Watcher walks towards the doctor and starts to turn into an essence, which fills the doctor in a white glow. Nyssa makes a comment that the Watcher was the doctor all this time. The glow finishes, leaving a young Peter Davison in Tom Baker's outfit. Just as he sits up, we get the credits. The end. Well, that was it. Jeez. Not a bad story. Let's go through the episode numbers. So episode 1 had 7.7 million viewers. Episode 2, another 7.7. Episode 3 had 5.8 million and episode 4, 6.1 million. Given how popular Tom Baker was, I am a little surprised at these lower numbers, especially to see that the actual regeneration episode of episode 4 had lower numbers than episode 1. That being said, you definitely get a big impact or foreboding feeling right from the start that this one is going to be different. It's a very strong opener, with some immediate character development of Tegan with her aunt, even if the scenes of her running through the TARDIS corridors gets a little tiring. Episode 1 and 4 feel strongly written, but things seem to meander a bit once the story moves to actual Logopolis. Some of the plot doesn't entirely line up, uh, just for me, because it was just weird that updating the chameleon circuit via the corrupted block transfer computations would affect the entire TARDIS like shrink everything. Given how much the doctor discusses the chameleon circuit being separated from the TARDIS internals, which makes sense because the master's TARDIS always appears as different shapes, but the inside control room always remains the same size. I think the only, the only point of needing to do that was to show the two sonic disruptors for the master to then steal and reuse later on in the story. But uh, apart from that, they, they really didn't serve any purpose. While block transfer computations for the use of creating or altering physical reality, especially through speech mutterings, is definitely interesting and an interesting concept. It's never brought up again past this story and maybe Castrovalva, the next one that we'll do. In fact, the story really skips over this idea of being able to speak computations that change the universe. The Doctor as a character has a long history of smashing tropes of magic whenever he gets involved with a um, less than technological crowd. I'll say primitive, but I, I only mean primitive in terms of their use of technology. He's suddenly fine with this kind of math where you can basically invoke structure. 
The music and actual technical production is very good. As this is the first full introduction of the master, I just wanted to put it out there that I think Anthony Ainley works more on a kind of a spectrum whenever he plays the character. He goes from fairly serious and really focused to an over-the-top, campy, mustache-twirling kind of character. Roger Delgado portrayed the master back in the John Pertwee area, which, unfortunately, he wasn't in any of the stories that we've covered so far. And I feel that he plays the character. He played the character very consistently. As I mentioned earlier, there's a reference at the beginning of episode one to Romana breaking the laws of the Time Lords, which were the same ones that caused the Doctor to be exiled on Earth. A twist here is that the Doctor can somehow just decide not to go to Gallifrey, and that's somehow okay. In the War Games, the Time Lords use their powers to bring the Doctor back to Gallifrey, even interfering with the operation of the TARDIS itself. Maybe the difference here is that back in the War Games, the Doctor had to actually invoke the Time Lords with that cool cube, uh, whereas here they were kind of just expecting... They had summoned the Doctor back to Gallifrey, uh, but they were just expecting him, so they weren't sure how long it was going to take him. Another point that I don't see too much in other uh, overviews of this story is that this is another rare moment in time when the TARDIS crew was just the Doctor and Adric, and they work really, really well together when they get into it. They have really good chemistry. It's a shame that just when the two of them get interesting, it's a shame that JNT felt the need to stuff so many extra people into the TARDIS so quickly. He was really worried about the bottom dropping out of the show when the Doctor changed over. When they give Matthew Waterhouse, um, the one who plays Adric, some good lines, he and the Doctor play really well together. The idea of the town of Legopolis constructed as an organic central processor with memory banks is a really interesting idea. From the way the huts are organized down to each Legopolitan inhabiting a specific memory address is really geeky nerdy cool. But did the audience ever pick up on that? I don't know. It's it's always hard to say. Okay. Um, I didn't really have anything else. Let's give this one a rating. I give this one 3.5 block transfer computed Legopolitans out of 5. I think there were a few minor problems with the story that I think just needed a little bit of extra work and time, and I think that would have been smoothed out quite well. Beginning with the TARDIS inside the TARDIS inside the TARDIS scenes were interesting, but they just went on for too long. I I think once the Doctor realized that they had materialized over another TARDIS, thinking it was just a police box... I think at that point it could have stopped and then they could have moved on um, instead of going through this extra, this Russian doll situation where they just keep going inside another uh, a recursive a recursive loop of the two TARDISes. A recursive loop of the two TARDISes. A recursive loop of the two TARDISes. The idea of recursion really comes back in the next story that we'll go through, Castrovalva. But I'll leave that one for that time. Um, I thought the Master was a really good... It was a really good introduction to the Master, the, the proper Master. I think he's... Anthony Ainley is a, a great actor. I really love his interpretation of the Master. But like I was saying before, uh, there's times where he definitely maybe doesn't take it as seriously as he should for some of the stories. Maybe we'll get there when we cover some of them. And in, in other ways, he's just so goofy, you know, that you almost you almost forget that he's he's supposed to be a Dr. Moriarty to Sherlock Holmes. He's supposed to be just pure evil. I thought, oh, yeah, one other thing I wanted to mention is I, how do I say this? I thought the idea of the Watcher being the future incarn- future regeneration of the Doctor was a, 
a good callback. I don't know if they did it. Well, they must have done it on purpose. But if it was a callback to when you think back to Planet of the Spiders and how Choje was a walking embodiment of the of Kanpo. Thanks for joining us on today's episode of Summons from Gallifrey. We covered Legopolis, Tom Baker's final story. If you have any comments or feedback, I'd love to hear it at mailbag at summonsfromgallifrey.com. But stay tuned for the next one where we'll cover Peter Davison's first story as the fifth doctor in Castro Valba. Happy New Year, everyone. Peace.